So next up, we have an amazing person who has been part of the Filecoin Minor X program since the early days. He also was one of the original members of North America Storage Provider Working Group and really helped us get that group started. Uh, he actually got into Filecoin mining and storage, being a storage provider uh, from inspiration from his son. And so I want to welcome to the stage Stu, um, who is going to talk about how to become a storage provider and why you would want to. So Stu, please come up here. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank you. You got two microphones? Okay. When we try to understand how to be a storage provider, a lot of us learn the hard way. Uh, I and many of my colleagues at Picnic were in the original Minor X cohort a couple of years ago. It's been a couple of years of learning how to be a storage provider as the uh, software, as Lotus has uh, developed over time. Uh, we also have a program called ESPA, I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, and that program takes about seven months to get people up to speed. So we're going to try to do it in a very quick 45 minutes, a very high level overview. Uh, what I want to do first, um, I'll introduce myself, Stu Berman, uh, CTO or Picnic. Picnic uh, specializes as a cloud provider. We're one of the, the first uh, larger North American cloud providers that has a commercial business as storage provider. So I don't know how many, if all of you, know what Filecoin is. So I figured I'd start from the very beginning just to get the, the concepts down at a very high level. Uh, as, as hopefully you know, really Filecoin is an open set of protocols. And I like to say it's got at least one public blockchain that we call mainnet. That's where the fill, the, the real fill, is used to store uh, information about the, uh, the, the data that we're storing as storage providers. However, there are other public blockchains out there that are part of this ecosystem. We have one like Testnet, and we have Calibration, and we have others that developers develop on. So it's not the only one, and this will be important later as I get into the uh, presentation. It is truly decentralized. Uh, there are a number of decentralized storage providers out there. Uh, but what makes Filecoin particularly uh, Web3 type is that it's open, you set your own prices. Nobody, Protocol Labs, doesn't tell me how much to charge for storing. They don't tell me how much I should charge for retrieving. It's really an open marketplace. It's whatever I might negotiate with customers, with data owners. So this is truly what we would expect in a, in a decentralized world, where the ownership is, uh, is really spread among many, and the control is in the hands of those who are participating. A key element of Filecoin is that as you store data, the data uh, transactions are recorded on the blockchain. So this is immutable, uh, that we, we can tell that the, the storage was properly stored and validated, and then every day it gets uh, checked for its integrity so that the data has been altered, and every day that gets posted to the blockchain. And the other thing about uh, uh, Filecoin is there's a chance to make block awards as a function of having these uh, this data stored on the network or stored uh, and recorded on the blockchain. Again, I said the uh, the principles of storing data is done on a transparent and open basis. It doesn't mean the data is all open. Some of it is. Some of it's uh, encrypted. Some of it is protected in terms of access. But the, the transactions that are occurring are open and transparent. Anybody can look on a blockchain explorer and see that, this, that, that data's been recorded into the network. So I guess the first thing to ask is, well, how do you learn to become a, uh, a storage provider? And I'm gonna break this, I'm gonna break this into sort of a, a spectrum where you can come in as a, a, a person like myself where I just wanted to understand it. I wanted to invest as little as I could in it just so that I could understand it and really, uh, really understand what it was about before I, I put any serious money into it. So I consider that really sort of a DIY, a do-it-yourself uh, approach where you, know, you, you read the material, you talk to people, and you learn how to do it through experience. 
But there are other uh, programs out there, such as ESPA, which is for large-scale enterprise class storage providers. And then there are some other programs that uh, are part of the community, such as the mentorship program, where you'll get uh, a limited amount of time, maybe 10 hours of uh, technical uh, mentoring to standing up your own system. I've listed a number of uh, uh, resources that I would recommend highly for anybody interested in becoming a storage provider that will give you all sorts of advice as well as instructions. So the Filecoin Slack channel is the first place I turn to. That's where the storage provider community is based. That's where most of us uh, chat with each other, have communications with protocol labs, with the developers, with uh, people interested in storing data, uh, others trying to build uh, products on the Filecoin network. So that's, that's the place I would always start. Of course, there's the, the official website, filecoin.io, uh, and has lots of information. There's a blog out there. There's just general information. There's the specifications on spec.filecoin.io, lotus.filecoin.io, are the instructions how to build the Lotus software to run a storage provider. Uh, I highly recommend you go to the Filecoin YouTube channel and search within the channel for show and tell. This is where a bunch of our, us as storage providers made these short videos on what our setups look like. So you can get a range of really small to really big in terms of how people put these together and a sense of scale. And then finally, from our Esper project, we have a website you can see on there, uh, m.phil.org, Esper Bootcamp Contents. This is where we've posted all of our videos, our documentation, uh, technical documentation, so feel free, this is uh, something we've given the community in terms of learning what we've learned and what we shared out to the whole community. As I said, uh, when I started, I started with a very, very small setup. Uh, I basically took a, a miner that I had, a crypto miner, and I bought some extra RAM, and I bought some uh, uh, enterprise data center class uh, hard drives, and uh, I converted that into my first all-in-one storage provider machine. And I looked it up recently. Uh, how much would it cost me to build that today if I just went out to uh, Newegg or uh, eBay and ordered some of these components? And it's roughly $4,000 to build a very small, very modest, very slow machine that can crank out like 10 sectors a day. So it's not going to win any races, but it does the job. And this is the sort of thing that would teach you the principles and how it works and what all the components look like as they act together. And uh, you, know, you can learn very cheaply. And then if you grew, you could repurpose some of the parts into your system, or if you really got big, you could keep it as a test machine that you, know, you could try out new, uh, new configurations and new software on. Uh, the other uh, slide I show here is uh, one of our colleagues, Ben, uh, from Picnic. He wrote the, uh, he, he did a video on the second uh, solar miner setup, and here he advocates for a really a full strength industrial single machine, single single person machine that, uh, that does a really nice job, but it's a lot more expensive than $4,000. So you can see, you can scale up and down from, I don't know if you consider 4,000 very little, but up to millions of dollars. So one of the things we all talk about is the economy, the market, the crypto markets, what's going on with Bitcoin and what's going on with Ethereum, as well as the broader financial market, the stock markets. And so the question people have is, well, is this a good time to get into Filecoin? And my perspective, my personal perspective, is this is a great time to get in. Why? Because the cost of fill is very low right now. And fill is used as collateral, so as a storage provider, you need to have it to store data on your network. And so what I want to do is give you a perspective over the last, last couple of years what the cost to seal one petabyte of data would be uh, the, the amount of fill hasn't changed that much, but the, the amount of money you spend on it really does. So two years ago, June 2020, the cost of fill was roughly 20 bucks per fill. So to, to seal one petabyte today with the prices of sealing today, it would be about $120,000, right? So it can, it can dwarf what you're spending on um, hardware. Uh, last year, uh, the average price that I was seeing for fill uh, over the course of the year was about $85. So that would mean for the same petabyte, it would cost me about a half million dollars just for the collateral, just for the fill, in order to assure people uh, that their data was safe. Today, 
it's $45,000 based on $7.50 per fill. So, you know, when would you rather get in in terms of being able to seal the same amount of data? I, I'm extremely optimistic about the future of Filecoin. Uh, I'm an ardent believer. I learned a few years ago as I got in what, it, what value it provides. Uh, and on the commercial side now, I can see there's so much interest. So aside from the financial uh, stats that I just gave you, there's two reasons I think uh, Phil and Filecoin make a lot of sense into the future. One is, on the commercial side, we're seeing so much interest by organizations to store their data, their archive, their cold data, and save money. And Filecoin's a perfect venue for that. We're seeing customers come to us asking about hundreds of petabytes, and in some cases, exabytes of data that they'd like to store. And they can save a lot of money doing that. Not only are they interested, but now, not just within Picnic, but within the ecosystem, as I talk to SPs around the world, we are starting to onboard this data. We're starting to move data, real data, into the network. It starts off slowly as a uh, proof of concept. You sign contracts, you get everything squared away. And so over the course of the year, you're going to see a lot more data come onto the network, real data from various organizations, nonprofit organizations, for-profit businesses. The, you know, the, the case is just uh, very, very compelling. The second thing that is important over the course of the next year, and you might have heard about it earlier, uh, are some of the new features like FVM, the, the virtual machine that's being built into Filecoin. And this will allow the, the, the us and the customers to do really remarkable things. Certainly things like smart contracts are really important. The idea that you can compute over data. So if we're storing your data and there's valuable information inside that data and now you can actually mine through it and pull more extract value out of the data that you've been storing as an owner of that data, this is really fabulous. So I expect that the markets, I expect that the financial community, I expect the IT world to start recognizing the importance and the value of, of a system like decentralized storage such as Filecoin. So I expect uh, this to be reflected ultimately both in the popularity, the recognition, and the price of Phil. So I don't know how many people are this technical. Hopefully you are. If not, uh, a, a brief detour. We use the term things like PIB and GIB. Uh, as opposed to what is commonly used out in the you know, general world of gigabytes and megabytes. And this is simply uh, a reminder that in the popular parlance, we use the decimal form, right? A thousand of something. A thousand, a thousand grams is a kilogram. A thousand bytes is a kilobyte. But in the storage world, we actually use the binary system, right? So everything's power of two, which means a kebibyte, a KB, <laughs> is really 1,024 bytes and not 1,000. And so that doesn't usually matter at the low end of scale, but when we talk about things like Filecoin and we start talking about exabytes and zettabytes and maybe yottabytes one day, you can see the difference starts growing and people often are asking like, why don't the numbers match up here? You know, I'm seeing this on my computer, but then you guys are showing that. And it has to do with the translation of whether they're using a decimal format to translate or they're using the, tr the true digital format. Uh, and another thing just worth mentioning, because uh, you know we have to move data around, there's this concept in the network side that you typically don't even measure things in bytes, you measure in bits per second. So you know, I did a little translation here. When we talk about a gigabit per second uh, of, of data transfer, it's really 125 million bytes per second. So that's just a reminder for folks that constantly uh, ask these questions like, why these numbers look different? Now, getting into the storage provider ecosystem, what I want to do is uh, uh, talk about this slide. Juan presented this uh, recently, yesterday, and maybe we'll do it again a few times. Uh, what I want to do is show you the kind of the flow of data as well as uh, stakeholders that are part of the uh, storage provider system and the Filecoin uh, ecosystem. So we start with uh, the actual data owners, the people that have the data, the, the customers. And what they typically do, they want to send that data in raw format or get it retrieved by somebody. And uh, here, uh, Juan calls them aggregators. These are basically brokers that can accept data in like tools like Estuary and BidBot. In some cases, storage providers like Picnic, we offer this service as well. We say, oh, we'll make it easy for you. 
we're, you know, we'll have a contract in dollars and we'll take your data and here, here's how much we'll store it for. And at this aggregator level, what happens is that raw data gets processed into a car file format. Car files content addressable archive. And that makes it easier and compatible with IPFS in terms of what files are where in the, uh, in the system. Then once that car file is created, that's when in the, in the pure sense, the storage provider accepts it, ingests it as a car file, and then seals it into either 32 gigabyte or gib sector or 64 gib sector. Those are the two sizes of sectors. So sometimes as an aggregator, what we have to do is we have to chunk down a big file. If we have a big video file that's multiple terabytes, we chunk it down to either 32 or 64 gig sectors. Put it onto the storage provider network. We store it, we make replicas for others to store so that it's not just one copy on the network. And then at the bottom you see there's a new uh, retrieval provider system being built by folks that want to specialize in caching and retrieval so that clients can easily get their data around the world and, and quickly. You can retrieve directly off my machine, off our systems, off the storage provider, but it's really not optimized for that uh, at this point. Uh, it depends on the, the way that's being stored for fast retrieval or not, and there's a limitation on how many files can be uh, retrieved at once. So retrieval provider system will be a way to optimize uh, fast retrieval for uh, people. And then finally, there's this indexing system which, ha which has to do with taking those uh, car files and index mapping the public files so that they're easily identified where they are, who's got them, uh, you know, as part of a service. The other two uh, stakeholders that really aren't on his map here are one, you have fill lenders. These are people who are gonna let you borrow fill, but often they wanna be connected into your wallet so they reduce the risk that you know, all their fill's gonna disappear one day for no reason. So they're typically part of that system. The other uh, stakeholder are these data DAOs that we're seeing develop. And this is really um, a, a community of various participants, storage providers, fill financiers, data owners and some others that are make up this system and make it for a community project, make it easier as a storage provider to work together and I don't have to go out and find deals if, uh, if it's gonna be part of the DAO that I'm part of. Uh, one thing worth mentioning is storage providers, when we seal a sector, that's a one-time process. We seal the sector, it takes hours of, uh, uh, of intense compute power. Um, the other thing is when we're using this fill collateral, uh, we're typically bundling it into what's called a deal, and that deal typically la lasts anywhere from six months, but more commonly 18 months before that deal expires. Pressing the wrong button here. Okay, so another concept that's critical as a storage provider is power. What is power? Well, generically, power is the amount of data occupying your sealed sectors, and why that's important is because the more power, the more data that's sealed in your sectors, the more likelihood you'll get block rewards. And then we break power down into two aspects. Raw power is what's really sealed on the disk in, in GIBs, 32 GIBs, 64 GIBs, times as many sectors as you have. But there's also this other incentive that's called verified deals, verified data, and that goes through a notary process where the data is checked to show that it's valuable, it's, it's real data. We have this uh, concept uh, under raw power called committed capacity. That's where we actually don't put data, we just seal uh, a certain amount of junk data into a 32 gig or 64 gig sector, and that's attributed to you as power. And later on, you can take real data and it can replace sort of this, uh, this junk data that's inside that sector. So you get credit for that. And that's a great way we all start up at the beginning just to get things rolling is to make sure we understand the whole process. But with verified data, the data has been uh, checked, audited, and it's actually got value to the world, to the network. And so you get 10 times the amount of power for that, but it does come at a cost of 10 times the amount of collateral. So it's much more expensive, but it's very lucrative. And the question is why is it so lucrative? Well, I don't need as much hardware because it's attributed to be 10 times more than it actually is. So I don't need as much disk space. Uh, I don't have to process as much because it is 10 times the power. In order to start being eligible for block awards, 
they always look at 10 TIBS raw power as the threshold for when you can start earning block awards. And the, 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 the likelihood of winning a, a block award has to do with your proportional power relative to the whole network. And I'll use here as an example, I'll use a PIB. So if you have a PIB of power, total power, what we're seeing today is roughly you win about a block a day. That block today, I just won one this morning. Uh, I think it's worth about $160, $170 for that block. It's actually 22 fill. So when I give you the, the value, it has to do with the, the, today's value on, on the exchange right. But it's generally going to be whatever, 22 fill, and that, that number increments very slowly over time as part of the incentive structure. Last year on my machine, during the high point, my, one of my blocks during the high point of the fill uh, uh, exchange rate, one block was worth almost $5,000. So it's important to realize, you know, you, okay, we're, uh, we're not generating dollars, we're generating fill. And so from a fill perspective, I think of it like I think of stocks, right? You, you want to buy low and sell high. So this is not the time for me to sell fill because it could be worth a lot more. It's, it's been worth a lot more. This is the time to buy something for me, not sell it. So you can think of fill sort of separately from dollars in the sense that there's a fill economy and there's a dollar economy. And you've got to be careful when you start connecting them. So let's talk a little bit more about fill as that utility token. First of all, where do you get it from? Well, you can go on an exchange, right? You can go on CoinList, Coinbase, and you can go ahead and just buy it for dollars. Uh, you can go to uh, another wallet, like uh, I use uh, Exodus, and I can simply exchange it for other crypto that I have. Uh, one interesting thing, and it's how I've gotten a lot of my fill, is by earning it. So you can get grants from the Filecoin Foundation, Protocol Labs, if you suggest a project, you want to offer value to the network, they'll offer a bounty or you can suggest a project. This is how we, uh, we proposed the ESPA project. We would provide value to the network by putting this, uh, this accelerator together to help others grow in the storage provider network. And so they're able to grant fill um, as a result of that. Now when you're on the test network, as I mentioned earlier, there's other blockchains, other Filecoin blockchains, you can go on the test net network and there's a faucet where you can get fill for free, but it's not real fill. Right? It's only used on the test network to test out your equipment. So that's how you really want to start. You don't want to take real fill and put it on a test machine and see what goes wrong. You know, get all the bugs worked out on the test network. You can use the exact same setup, the exact same equipment. You just have to uh, uh, start it up a little differently than you would for the main net. So again, I said uh, you can decouple fill from US USD. So the fill lenders will lend you fill and be, expect to be repaid in fill. So that's a great way to decouple the whole problem with USD varying against fill. You have your fill accounts over here. You're, you're paying interest on it in fill. And you can more than make up for it with your block awards. So you, you borrow fill, you get enough block awards to pay off the fill interest plus the principal, and then you have some left over. So you're ahead in fill. When you decide to exchange it for dollars, that's a totally separate question. Uh, I'm going to give you an example on my little machine at home. Um, my raw power today is 113 tips. It's taken me, with my little machine, it's taken me almost two years to get there. Uh, however, my adjusted power, in terms of I seal a lot of verified data, it's 900 tips. It's almost a petabyte. And that just comes from me just taking all the fill that I got and reinvesting in the system, letting it grow and grow and grow. And if I were just doing CC sectors or unverified data, my power would be 113. But because I'm doing a lot of verified deals, uh, it's actually much, much higher. So that's how I'm able to get about five blocks per week in rewards. Again, that's, that's my personal machine. That's not our commercial systems, which are far larger. At the bottom of the uh, slides, you can see some of the... Uh, the fill lenders, I'm familiar with Anchorage, Dharma, CoinList. So let's talk about hardware requirements. 
So I think it's really important to get, get it through in our heads that there's this, this metric, right? The amount of fill that you have or have access to really determines how much you're going to seal, right? So you need more fill to seal more stuff. But the type and the amount of hardware you have determines how quickly you'll seal it. So my little machine, I can barely get through uh, you know, 20, 24 uh, sectors per day. Uh, that's, that's really tiny. So even if I had all the fill in the world, uh, it would take me forever to make you know, really, really large scale uh, storage. So let me dig into the, the main components of Lotus. Lotus is one of the types of software that's used to create, uh, to be on the, the, the Filecoin network. There's others out there, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, first of all, there's the Lotus node. Lotus node is what actually syncs the blockchain. So you have a local copy, you've gotta be in sync with the blockchain. Lotus Miner is a task that runs. It does really primarily two things. It does the uh, daily posts, the proving every single day, and it does task scheduling for all the processes below. There's the storage repo. You got a long-term storage, you gotta put it someplace. So you might put it on a, a series of JBODs, a, 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 an array of disks. I use ZFS, some people use Ceph. Uh, but you've got to store your, your, your data someplace. You can start off with a single hard drive if you want. You can buy some 14 or 18 tib hard drives, and that's a great way just to get started. That's, that's how I got started. Uh, sealing workers, this is what does the sealing, that one-time process of taking car files and converting them to sealed data that gets a, accounted as power. So every sector has to go through that, but that's a one-time process for each sector as opposed to the daily uh, posts that happen every day uh, based on the uh, Lotus Miner process. And then finally, if you're gonna take in real data and allow people to retrieve that data, you have to have a market node, uh, and that allows for the uh, pricing to be set and allows for data to come in and out of your system. Other things you've gotta have if you wanna be a successful storage provider, you've gotta have a high-speed network both internally in your LAN, because we move data around. Depending upon your architecture, you might need a one gig or a 10 gig or faster network uh, internally. And then you need the, you know, that high speed internet uh, connection if you're going to be dealing with public data. If you're going to be storing real data because you have to move that data from the outside world into your system. If all you're doing is CC, of course, you don't need a high speed internet because you're, not, you're do, just doing chain sync. Uh, some of the requirements on the CPU, you've got to have SHA extensions. So this is typically your, like your AMD Ryzen and later processors, Epix. Uh, some of the new Intel chips uh, allow you to have that. But you also have to have a lot of RAM. So the minimum you get started with is 128 gig of RAM just to even get things started, which is why some of the older Intel SHA-based chips didn't work because they only let you have 64 gig of RAM on those. Uh, you also need high-speed NVMe sealing uh, space. Uh, that's for your sealing uh, process. Uh, I like to use it for my chain as well. Um, again, at the most basic level, you can do this on a single, all-in-one machine. And uh, uh, again, I estimate you're running about 10 sectors a day if you're lucky. Uh, most operators, though, have specialized machinery that focuses on a particular task, and they've got large clusters of machine to process a lot of data data very quickly and typically they'll put it in a nice commercial data center as opposed to like my basement. So now you've got your equipment, you kind of understand the system, how do you actually operate, right? Well one, you better know Linux. Uh, you know, there's no Windows version and as a storage provider you're probably going to run it on Ubuntu or something similar uh, and you're probably going to use command line because there's really no GUI for this uh, for the most part. I think if you've got reasonable technical aptitude, anybody can learn how to do this. It's not, it isn't, you know, rocket science, but you know, you've got to be dedicated. Uh, you have to figure out which version of a Filecoin implementation you're going to use. Lotus is what we use. Uh, most source providers use it. It's the oldest uh, implementation, but there is, uh, there are other um, implementations like Lotus, uh, excuse me, like Venus, Forest, Fuhan, and uh, they have other reasons that people are interested in them. Uh, for, in for instance, I believe Venus offers resource pooling, which is a nice concept. So you don't necessarily have to have all the ded dedicated equipment that you would with Lotus. 
Um, and again, you always should be starting on testnet just to make sure everything works before you uh, risk wasting anything. Uh, before you actually press the button and start it, you really should have uh, a plan, right? How much fill am I going to need? How far do I want to go? Right? Don't just, I mean, if people get surprised, I see this on, on the forums all the time, you know, like, hey, I started doing this, now what? It's like, well, what's your plan? Well, I don't know, I just started doing this. Well, you're going to run out of fill, or you're going to have a lot of fill, and your hardware is not going to be spec right, so make sure your plan is right, and know what your goal is, uh, at least through your first step. There are reference uh, implementations that are uh, documented in various places, GitHub in particular, and YouTube. That's a great place to look. Uh, then you've got to install the software, build it, configure it, and finally tune it. Uh, again, there's, there's great documents available publicly that, you, that I referenced, lotus.filecoin.io and ESPA documents I mentioned earlier. And then once you've actually successfully done this on testnet and you know you're not gonna blow up your system, <laughs> Go ahead and switch to the, the main net network and start with sealing CC sectors and get successful. Three minutes? Oh boy, I better go faster. Um, okay, so now you understand it. You got to tune your network and get as much as you can out of it. So we're coming up toward the end. Uh, Filecoin community. This is absolutely critical. This is not about lone miners in their basements, you know, pushing a button. This is about us working together collaboratively as a community. That's where the real value comes out. Uh, of being part of the community. Uh, please be involved. It's really very, very rewarding. I've met lots of people, folks that are in this room right now. I've got to meet people, and we help each other out. This is not a dog-eat-dog -dog world for the most part. We help each other. John from Seagate, we work together. It's fantastic. Uh, so we're really partnered together in a very, very collaborative sense, uh, and, and you'll get the most out of it by being part of this. Uh, go ahead and propose your own projects. Uh, contribute to the community. Think about value-added services you can add on, such as encryption, staging, picnic. We have a data ingestion uh, pipeline that we uh, offer to some of our partners. Um, when you com compare to Google and Amazon, extremely competitive customers are really interested in, in Filecoin as a service. Um, even though that, you could still charge zero fill for your services within the, uh, the community and it's still lucrative in terms of just the fill that you're generating. Uh, we did have uh, uh, a case where I, I know of a, uh, an entity that wanted to store uh, a lot of data, pet petabytes of data, and they were offering a million dollars to store one and a half pibs of data every month for seven years. Uh, a quick plug for our ESPA, our Enterprise Storage Provider Accelerator. Uh, we hold uh, boot camps every quarter, every three months. Uh, lately in Las Vegas, next, next one, the applications are up right now for October 11th. Go to web3espa.io, you can see more about it. Uh, again, this is for companies that really want to get uh, uh, charged at the enterprise level. And then finally, I reach out, ask you all to join us. My, uh, my Filecoin Slack handle is Stuberman, uh, but please don't DM me. Just let's talk publicly because you can share what we know and very, very little stuff, very few things are very confidential, and that then DM's fine. Uh, join a regional group. We have groups all over the world. Uh, there's, for instance, uh, Phil Korea, Phil Japan, there's a Phil North America. So get involved with your local community as well. Look on Twitter, look on Reddit. We're everywhere, and that's it. Thank you.